Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for our time together. Uh, Lord, what a privilege it is to be uh, with your people. And Lord, uh, to be able to present uh, your truth. Lord, may it be your truth. If it be anything that be of me, Lord, I pray you obliterate it. Never to be remembered again. But Lord, everything that you uh, are about, your concepts, your ideas, everything that you desire, may, may it come shining forth. And uh, we just appreciate you. Thank you so much for involving us together. It's uh, what a pleasure it is to be in your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. Now, I'm going to cut across a lot of territory. You know, we're going kind of like the end of the last chapter in the book. You, you know, we're kind of skipping across a lot of territory, but I'm going to try the nutshell. Uh, most of you probably already know uh, the book of Galatians. Um, you know, Paul is contrasting um, the bondwoman and the free woman, which would be Sarah and Hagar, you know, in chapter 4 especially. And uh, as he leads up to, from chapter 4, he moves in chapter 5, where he starts, he starts off with uh, 5 verse 1. He starts off with, for freedom you are set free, or for liberty, or uh, whatever your translation says, it literally means uh, for freedom's sake, you have been set free. And that sounds like a good deal. I mean, I think everybody likes freedom, right? I mean, we are Americans. We take our freedom pretty personal. And uh, we don't like it when people infringe. There's a lot of that going on now. But um, so, but what, for what, what reason have you been set free? Well, if you go, as you go through chapter 5, what happens is you begin to understand. He starts contrasting law versus grace. <coughs> Verse 13, he says, don't use your freedom for the flesh, but to be a bond slave one to another. Now that sounds, you know, that, that sounds weird. Okay, you just told me I was free, now I'm going to be a slave. Now, now get this, now get, get to hear this. The only way you're ever going to be a bond slave, and a bond slave is someone who freely gives over their will and and their will, their, their schedule, give everything over to another person for their control. And the only way you're ever going to do that is if you're free. Because of, you can't be a bond slave until, number one, you've been set free. So a lot of people that have been set free in Christ have never become bond slaves. And that's their right. Do you realize that? That's your right. Like some people say, well, I don't want to do X, Y, Z. And you know what I tell them? I invite you not to. Because you're free in Christ. My job is not to, to shackle you to, an, to enslave you again. Okay? This is something you get to do, not something you have to do. So, wait a minute. You mean I get to be a bond slave? Yeah. Hmm. Sounds weird. But that's the only way to live, as a bond slave one to another. So then when you get down through the chapter and you get to verse 23... The famous right, fruit of the Spirit. How do I know I'm a good Christian? By my fruit. Uh, got to break some bad news for you. Not your fruit. That's the fruit of the? Right. Can't count that. Okay? So that's a discussion for another time. But as you move down through this, he starts talking about application. And the reason I'm jumping to chapter 6 is because chapter 6 is where freedom and spirituality become functional. Uh, how many times have you ever heard preacher types tell you that you need to be Christ-like? Can you count? No. If you've been in church like I have all my live long days, I have heard it ad nauseum I'm supposed to be Christ-like. But rarely have they told me why. Okay? So I'm telling you, you have been set free. I'm telling you, you can be spiritual. And it's not so you can just, you know, put your thumbs in your lapels and say, well, how do you do? I'm spiritual today. <laughs> because that's useless to be spiritual. I mean, in that context. So if you look at the very last verses of Galatians chapter 5, I'm going to again jump into... This right after in verse 24 it says now now talking about the fruit of the spirit 
Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified, that's major emphasis, crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk. Walk is major emphasis. Walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. So he's giving you an indication of what it starts to show you how being spiritual is beneficial, how spiritual can be effective. You know, being spiritual is not just so God is happy with you. Now, I got some news for you. God not only loves you, but he likes you. Sometimes I feel like in Christianity we have told people subliminally that God doesn't like you and you need to shape up and do better so he'll like you. You ever get that feeling? I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one. But that that's put that to rest. He loves you, but he also likes you. So you, it's not about you performing for him. So he likes you. He wants you to get in on what he's doing for your benefit and for your satisfaction and gratification. There's a way to live this life It'll make you run breathless. But if you're constantly trying to fix yourself, good luck. You're going to be frustrated and you're going to hate this life. So the title of this is A Job for Spirituals. A Job for Spirituals. So we're mainly going to be hovering around the first verse in chapter 6. Now I'll just read it. Just get it in front of us. Then I'm reading out of the NASB. Brethren, even... If a man is caught in a trust, any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, lest you too be tempted. Now, we're going to take this verse and we're going to break it down. We're going to look at it very detailed. And then we're also going to look, I'm going to, also I'm going to ruin a verse for you, by the way. Look forward to that, me ruining a verse for you. You're never going to look at it the same, and you're never going to use it the same again because we abuse it and use it wrong all the time. Okay? Does that sound exciting? Yeah. You look like you're about to kill me already. Okay, all right. So, first, first thing. First thing. That don't work at all. It problem. problem identified it says brethren even if a man is caught now uh, King James says overtaken does anybody have another word other than caught or overtaken no okay now uh, oh and I wanted to prompt you too in the first verse there's three words that are major emphasis now if, you, if you've never heard me before or never been around me, um, I'm big about major and minor emphasis. I don't know if you remember that from times past or not. But what it is is major and minor emphasis is this. In the Greek text, and Spanish does this too, it's not just Greek, but in uh, Greek text, the way they have words arranged in the sentence can bear stress, major stress or minor stress. Well, in this verse, there's three words that are major emphasis. In other words, the Holy Spirit is shouting from the page. I'm alerting you to that because later I'm going to ask you which were three words. Now, I may, I may let you answer, I may not, because I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. I'm not trying to play gotcha. But be thinking about that. Which three words are major emphasis in this verse? Okay? So, the problem identified is, the, is that if a man is caught or overtaken. Now that word overtaken or caught in the Greek literally means eaten before others. Eaten before others. Now what connotation does that give you? What picture did I just paint for you? What is happening to the person? What, what comes to your mind when I say eaten before others? Being devoured. Being devoured. 
So this 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 thing is killing them or her. I won't isolate just the men, although we bear quite a bit of responsibility. Right, guys? You better say yes if you're married. <laughs> right? But I mean we 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 see those people. We see people that have they're just helpless. They have been caught. They're being devoured in front of us. It says that you have been taken or and, and it doesn't and it may be by surprise or it may just be by opportunity. But if a man is caught in any trespass, and the word trespass is a, a sidestep or uh, a lapse or a, a deviation, it could be intentional, it could be willful. It, it may be something that happened, spare the moment, or something very calculated. Now, it says, if you see anybody like that, now, what's the normal procedure that you've seen? I won't, let, I won't ask you to answer, but just think back. What's the normal procedure when someone you see somebody like that? How do we normally address it? You see, remember, we're talking about the people that are spiritual. This is a job for spirituals. So the problem has been identified. We have a brother that's taken in a fault or he's caught or he's being devoured now second point a helper is identified you who are spiritual now how many people feel comfortable calling yourself spiritual? What would you think if someone announced that they were spiritual? <laughs> it's kind of like whenever I'm dealing with somebody. Like, How many of you have ever been buying a car or buying something and the person you're buying it from they go, don't worry, I'm a Christian. And you go, oh. man, I wish you hadn't said that. Because now I don't want to buy it from you. Right? Because it sounds boastful. And I'm not saying that we should go around touting, hey, by the way, I'm spiritual. But the one thing we do have to recognize is, if nobody admits it, what happens? That job goes undone. What happens to the person who's caught in a fault? See, what I'm trying to get to is this. You have to recognize when you're spiritual. How do you know when you're spiritual? Go back to chapter 5. What's chapter 5 say? Well, are you free? Are you? And are you a slave? Those, two, those are two good indications. So it's someone who is free, but also someone who is a slave to his brother. Who does not give an occasion just for the flesh. Right? A lot of times I'm afraid we have people that say I'm spiritual or that I'm godly or whatever. And they say it because they're really proud of their discipline or whatever it may be. But you who are spiritual, and the word spiritual is the Greek word, and I'm not trying to give you a Greek lesson, but it's important to know, is pneumatikos. Now, pneuma means breath, spirit. Ikos, or kos, or tikos, means to be adapted to. Now, this type of language is used in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 and 3, where he where Paul's talking about the natural man, the spiritual man, and the carnal man, carnal one and two. Like when you get to chapter three, he says, you are, you are babes, but are you not carnal? But he uses the word carnal twice, but the word, they're two different words. The first carnal is sarkinos. The, 
the sarps means the the flesh, but it, it, the the sarkinos enos means that you are and you can't help it. But then he says, but you are still carnal. You are sarki sarkikos, just like the pneumatikos. In other words, he says, you have adapted yourself to your flesh. In other words, you were babes here and you couldn't help it. You're a baby. Can't stop that. But now you're still carnal. In other words, you're still, you're a willful baby. Now there's something, I noticed most of you walked in here, except for <laughs> one. Right? I think only one person walked, did not walk in here. Am I correct? Which person didn't walk in here? I assume there's a baby in there. Not anymore, but there was. <laughs> right? Now, what would you have thought if somebody carried me in in a bassinet? <laughs> what would you have thought? Uh, there's something big time wrong with that dude. <laughs> that, would, that, is the, that is the physical equivalent of a spiritual person who has become adapted to his flesh. He's a willful baby. So what's a spiritual person? What's a pneumaticos? Someone who's adapted to their spirit. It's someone who has matured and has learned and grown and attached himself, grown attached to the spirit. In other words, he's walked in the spirit so long, it's just like normal. It just happens. It's just part of who they are. So we need the spirit. The helper identified is a person who has walked in the spirit to the point that they just they just do it naturally because that has become their way of living. Now that sounds fantastic, doesn't it? Well, how do you get how do you get to that point? Well, it doesn't happen overnight. It has to happen, and I'm not saying you practice it. I'm just saying you you as you walk in the in the light of what God, where God's going, where he's, you're looking where he's looking, you're thinking what he's thinking, you're saying what he's saying, and it becomes natural. Those are the people you want restoring people. Those are the people you want helping people. Because someone has to admit it. But they admit it for the benefit of somebody else, not for themselves. They don't say, I'm spiritual, look at me, be impressed by me. No, they're spiritual on behalf of somebody else. See, that's what being a bond slave is. You're not bond slave just so people can say, isn't he humble? Oh my, isn't he humble? No, that's worthless. You're humble, you're a slave, so somebody else can climb on your shoulders and go farther than you. See, your job as a believer, my job as a believer, is to become the least spiritual person in the room. You know what that means? That means you push everybody ahead of you to where they're better than you are. They're farther than you are. They're more capable than you are. That's a spiritual person. And when you meet that person, he's the one that restores those. I'm afraid... We don't have too many of those in a lot of fellowships. I have no idea about, I don't know enough about your fellowship to say that. Do you understand? So I'm not, I'm not casting a dispersion on anybody. I'm just saying we need to evaluate where are we? Who am I? Am I one that can restore somebody? The third point is a solution identified. Solution identified. Restore such a one. Now this restore means to completely and thoroughly repair. We all have vehicles. We, when we get it fixed, what do we say whenever it comes out running, running well? 
good as good as new. In other words, it's, it's running better. It's running like it did when the first day it was made. So where are we supposed to re repair or to restore one? Now, in other places, this same Greek word is translated in different passages. I can give you the passages if you want. Uh, I've got them listed. But it's translated mending, perfected, perfect, perfectly joined together, prepared, or framed. Those are different ways that that same word for restore is translated. So does that give you a clearer picture of what it means to restore? So you're taking someone who has, who has splattered themselves. And guess what? They splatter themselves and they can't get up. They can't go any farther. They're stuck. They're being eaten alive. And if nobody comes to help, guess what happens? They stay where they are. There's no hope. Guess what God has done? He has rigged this. He's rigged it. I need you and you need me. Sorry. It's the way it is. We need each other. If you think you're going to get through this life, if you think you're going to get through this life called Christianity, that we call Christianity, if you think you're going to get it alone, you're crazy. If you think you're going to achieve what we say Christ-likeness, you ain't going to do it alone. You need somebody. The solution has been identified. See, Jesus wa washes the feet of his disciples. See, there, there's a good stance. You're, you're, you're lowering yourself, for performing a menial task. Now, when you wash, now, what, what if Jesus would have washed their feet with no water? How'd that have went? What if he'd have washed their feet with sandpaper? Would he have got the dirt off? Yeah. Along with everything else. Now what if he used hot water? Scalding hot water. How that have went? <laughs> it gives me a thumbs up. I'd like to see that. Or ice cold water. Or what if he would have been rough or gruff? See what I mean? It, it's, it's a gentle action. So we're looking for the solution. We're looking for a spiritual person and because it says in the spirit of meekness. Now, this is a procedure identified. It says, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Now, the King James says meekness. Gentleness and meekness is not weakness. Meekness, this word actually means strength under control. This means that the person that's restoring the one has the ability to obliterate that person. They have it in their power to completely destroy them, finish them off. But they don't. Think about that. They've got it within their power and in their right. Because is the person guilty? Absolutely he's guilty. Is there any defense? No. Even if it was by accident, even if he didn't mean to do it, it's still no defense. Ignorance of the law is not a defense, is it? Not that we got much law going on, but anyway, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's not a defense. So this person has the ability to completely obliterate them. But it says in the spirit or the pneuma of meekness or, or, or gentleness. Just like Jesus washing their feet. He's doing it gently. Not scrubbing too hard. Not using abrasive soap. But he's trying to 
restore them back to cleanliness. But then it says, each one looking to yourself or consider yourself. Now, I, I like sometimes Greek, you know, we get a lot of our English words from Greek. Here's the, uh, here's the Greek word. For consider or, or uh, in the NASB it says looking to yourself. What do you see? What? I heard it. Scope. Well, how do we use a scope, Hunter? <laughs> I, got a, I got a woman, a wife going. Hmm. I tell you why they use a scope. <laughs> That's right. It is to zero in. It's to bring it into focus, into the right line of sight. You see, because when we go to help somebody, it's dangerous for us. How many of you have ever seen, I know you've seen movies and maybe even real life stuff, where people rush back into burning buildings to rescue someone. Why would they do that? Why? They're, the house is on fire, ready to fall down, and they run back in there. Why would they do that? Is that not crazy? But that's the same position we're in when we find the brother or sister that's caught and being eaten alive by something. We're supposed to approach them in a spiritual way, being a spiritual person, restoring them back to fullness, completeness, reconnected or rejoined. So that why? Why? For what reason? Why would we do that? spiritual person has the heartbeat of who? The Father. The Spirit. They bleed the same blood. They bleed the same emotions. They view things the same way. And a spiritual person, even though it's dangerous for them, they rush in to save the one. To restore them back to See, your spirituality is not necessarily for you. It's for the other person. To restore them back. So they'll be equipped to do what? Repeat the process. Now, I got time to destroy your idea of a verse. Let's just keep reading. Bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Wow, what a statement. So everything we just talked about in verse 1 fulfills the law of Christ. Wow. For if anyone thinks him, he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work. Then he will have reason for boasting regard to him, in regard to himself alone and not regard to another. For each one shall bear his own load. Now this is still in the context of others. Still in the context of others. And let the one that is taught the word share all good things to him who teaches. Now I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to ask you a question. How many generations of people are in that verse? How many generations in verse 6? How many people are represented? Huh? How many? I got two. Any more? No one else? 
You have the one that is taught, right? If he's taught, that implicates that there's what? Teacher. Or up to two. Then what does it say? Share it. To him who? So you're going to share it. To one who? Teaches. <laughs> Let him who is taught teach one who teaches. What have I just shown you? I've shown you the biblical standard of discipling people. So how many generations should your teaching make it through? Something, ain't it? Look at the next verse. What does it say? Ah, be not deceived. God is not mocked. He who sows to the flesh will reap flesh. But he who sows to the Spirit will reap spirit. That verse is not talking about you doing good, getting good, doing bad, getting bad. It's not about that. It's about discipling somebody and what product you get out of it. Now, is it true if you do bad things, bad things are going to happen? Is it true? <laughs> Most of the time it's true, right? You drive 100 miles an hour down this road right here, what's going to happen? It's going to be bad for multiple people probably. Right? But if you do good, that, is that true? It's absolutely true. But that's not what that verse is talking about. That verse is talking about what you sow into people. What you sow into people, well, that's what you're going to get out. You sow flesh, you're going to get flesh. You sow spirit, you're going to get spirit. I'm glad to destroy that for you. Because what am I talking about now? I'm talking about spiritual people here. We're still talking about spiritual people. Isn't that amazing? And that bear one another's burdens, that word bear there, means to do it as a lifestyle habit. To do it. So for the rest of your life, as your habit of living... You will bear one another's burdens. And the restore is the same type of word. It means to do it as a lifestyle habit. It's just the way you live. And for the rest of your life, you're going to restore them because that's just who you are. That's a spiritual person. A spiritual person is someone who rescues those that are being devoured by whatever it is. It could even be a good thing from the wrong perspective. Would you agree with that? Is there anything wrong with, you know, uh, you know, racing cars or racing motorcycles? No. But can it be taken to a point that it is destructive? Absolutely. So anything can happen. So you can't say, well, that's always bad. And that's, you know, you can't do it. Whatever's <laughs> eating your brother alive, whatever that is, it's your job to help them. To restore them, to fix them, help repair them, and invest in them. To what point? To where whatever you say can be repeated exactly by the fourth generation without you getting involved. It's pretty heavy duty stuff. Paul does it. I, Paul, to you, Timothy, I want you to invest in faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul does it. Why doesn't he name the others also? Because Paul has no intention of knowing who they are necessarily. 
Why? Because it's Timothy's job to make sure he transfers correctly. Isn't that wild? So, a job for spirituals. Problem identified, you have taken in a fault. Helper identified, that's me and you, spiritual people. Solution identified, restore. And there's a procedure with meekness, with power under control, with caution that we are not taken in by the same fault. So that we can restore them back to better than new. Oh yeah. What three words are major emphasis in verse one? Is anybody brave enough to venture a guess? I venture a guess. Okay. Um, um, overtaking spiritual and restore. That's what I figured. Overtaken, spiritual, spiritual and, and restore. restore. Got one out of three. Wow. I'll tell you the answer in a minute. Anybody else? Okay. Only one restore, brave soul? Restore, huh? gentleness, and um, considerate. Considerate. Again, one out of Well, let's see. What'd you say? Restore gentleness and considering. Oh, I'm sorry. You're, you're 0 for 3. Oh, man. Brethren, man, and spiritual. Brethren, man, spiritual. You're 0 for 3, too. Mm. Now, see, you see. There's only 10 words left, people get involved. <laughs> <laughs> now, get this. Now, get this. Think about this. Think about this. This, this, was, this was not written in English. Okay? So the Holy Spirit is, is guiding the pen <coughs> And the Holy Spirit is shouting words. And it's important that we know what words he's shouting. You ready? You may read it for you. I'll read it as it's emphasized. Brethren, if, any, if a man is caught in a, in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. In a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, lest you too be tempted. So which ones were they? <laughs> just, 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 caught? Just kidding. I know. I, I think I made it obvious. Caught and you too. So why would the Holy Spirit obviously... Caught! He's caught! Look at, look at the, the passion of the Spirit. I know. I'm sorry. See, this isn't even the sermon that gets me in trouble. And then, but he's like, he's not just concerned about the person. You too! See, we emphasize, we emphasize things, and it's over and over and over and over again. The Holy Spirit, and, and, and he's, he's emphasizing you. You are the commodity. You are the most important thing. It's not necessarily the action. It is you. You are, you are dependent. You are the important thing. People are the business. People. Glad I could ruin that for you. Any questions, comments, or criticisms? I'm open to all. Gladly. Okay. Let the one who is taught. If you're taught, that implicates a teacher. Okay? Share all good things. Man, I could talk a lot about all good things. With him who teaches. So this person who is taught teaches this person who's going to teach. In other words, don't share information with someone who's not going to pass it on. Because if you're sharing information into someone who's not going to pass it on, what are you doing? Wasting your time. 
don't do it, do it. Very good. I like it. So how do you see that? Just give me a little perspective. Okay. Because we're talking about edification to some degree. Yes. But yet, what things do you share with a non-believer? Gospel only? Is that what we're talking about? Two different things here? I mean, I mean, the gospel it's, encom- it's a little bit. The gospel encompasses more than heaven and hell. Okay? Right. Okay. The gospel is huge. Maybe one day we'll get a chance to talk about it. It's big. All right? So the gospel encompasses the good. The good news is what God sent Jesus to do. Everything he packed in him is gospel. All right? Everything that that encompasses. So when you're talking to a non-believer, what are you going to talk to him about? All good things. But he's going to look at you like a dog looking at a stereo. He's going to probably whine a lot. It hurts his ears. But what happens? You need a miracle of God. Which means you got to plant the seed. That's right. And it's not up to you to let it grow. Right. Right? What do you do? Check out. See what happens. But when it starts to grow, what do you do? You invest. Right? And and do we grow orchards for pretty leaves? We look for reproduction. Just need to make sure that's clarified. Yeah. So when you when someone teaches someone, they're expecting them, it's a given that this person is going to produce these two people. And that they're doing, looking for a particular kind of person, one that's going to teach. Because if they're not going to teach, you're wasting your time. I, I, I have a lot of people that like to hear me tell them cool things. <laughs> but it's not going anywhere. And I know that. So am I counting on this? Am I counting on that kind of person to do this? Do I throw this person away? I'm looking for a particular kind of person. But when I find the person, when I find the person that's going to teach one that's going to teach, I'm going to unload the truck. Interesting, eh? You didn't know it was all packed in it. So again, we're going back to this is a, this is a job for spirituals. This is what being spiritual is for. Not just so you can pat yourself on the back and make God like you. He likes you. Put it to rest. Let's get busy. Anything else? Thank you for the interaction. <laughs> I'm sorry I yelled. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for our time together. I thank you for uh, those that are here, Lord. It is not by accident that any of us are here. I pray that you would uh, use this uh, to further your kingdom. And may you be glorified in all things. Uh, Lord, we are so, so thankful uh, for your word, for the writings of Paul, and how you died in his hand. And we give you the praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.